Thank you for joining us today. My name is Philip Greer and I'm the CEO of Best Lawyers. This discussion is a part of a series that we're producing about COVID-19 legal issues. The panel was created to develop a better understanding of the current concerns companies are facing during this pandemic. Today, I'm joined by three real estate thought leaders to talk about real estate contracts. We have Chris Camara from Washington, D.C. Chris is a partner at Holland and Knight. He concentrates his practice in commercial real estate law, including all aspects of real estate acquisition and disposition, development, leasing, management, and financing. He represents landlords and tenants for office, retail, industrial, and other product classes. Thank you for joining, Chris. Thank you. Next, we have Nancy Park from Sacramento, California. Nancy is the Sacramento office managing partner at Best Best and Krieger. She works with both the private and the public sector, focusing on real estate transaction, leasing, finance, and business contracts. Nancy represents real estate entities, lenders and borrowers, landlords and tenants, and large and small businesses. Thank you for joining, Nancy. Absolutely, thanks. And finally, we have Roy Oppenheim from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Roy is a co-founder and senior managing partner at Oppenheim Law. He focuses on foreclosure defense, real estate, loss mitigation, and internet ventures. Thank you as well uh, for joining, Roy. Thank you. Nancy, we'll start with you. Why is it important right now for landlords and tenants to review their rental contracts? Right now, uh, it's important to know whether a tenant has an excuse uh, to not pay under their lease uh, for force majeure if they have been forced to vacate their premises um, for a shutdown. So for instance, if uh, a tenant is a um, hair salon, if they have been uh, forced to shut down through some of the emergency orders in California, hair salons are one of the non-essential businesses that are not allowed to operate right now, um, then they cannot occupy their premises. And under their lease, um, in particular, the, usually the force majeure clause, um, some leases allow for tenants not to pay if the, um, if their acts of God or other reasons um, that might prohibit payment. Some leases though make rent payment the one item that is still required under force majeure. So very important to review that particular clause to see whether rent is still required. Now, um, the emergency orders that have come out have allowed uh, that uh, the governors, for instance, um, in many cases have encouraged landlords and tenants to work together so that um, they work something out and maybe offer rent deferrals or rent abatements or things like that. It is not required and the rent is still owed even if there was um, a rent deferral um, under the emergency orders that have come out. But evictions in California in particular and in many other states have been um, a moratorium has been placed on eviction so that if somebody didn't pay rent, regardless of the terms of their lease, they would be, um, they would not be evicted at least until the moratorium is over. In California, that's uh, May 31st is the end of the moratorium. So, so what I'm general advice? Like just one thing. Oh yes, please. In, in Florida, while there's a, probably a moratorium on evictions, that, that moratorium is really more for residential and commercial. And so we've seen a few overzealous landlords to date try and get uh, judgments against their commercial tenants. While you may, while a judge will likely not evict them, once that judgment is entered, it's too late for them to go into bankruptcy court because then that judgment turns that, that party into a, effectively a, a, a preferred creditor. And so we are working very closely with bankruptcy counsel, especially under a new section of the bankruptcy code that everyone should be familiar with. It's subchapter five of section of, of, of a chapter 11. It's for small uh, types of, of, of folks that, that Nancy's talking about, maybe the hair salon, the nail salon, nail salon, which could actually stop in the tracks a judgment against them, which could proceed, even though it won't lead to an actual eviction, it just puts them behind the eight ball. So for example, there's a place called 2J's here, a very popular uh, series of, of uh, delis, there are about 11 of them. They filed for chapter 11 just yesterday because their, their landlord was just not willing to work with them. And so that just stops everything for a period of probably 60, 90. It could go out as far as, as a few hundred days before this landlord's going to be able to do anything. And during that time, they should be able to work something out or get new, new financing to keep them in place. So the, what would be the general advice? It sounds like you're saying uh, these landlords and tenants should be speaking to each other and trying to work out a solution. Uh, Nancy, is it, what, what general advice are you giving right now to uh, to landlords and tenants? Yeah, communication is the key. We're really encouraging parties to come together and work something out. There's no one size fits all solution. It's really gonna depend on the size of the tenant, the operation, whether they've been prohibited from operating, whether they have any resources 
and the character of the landlord. We found that institutional landlords are much more likely uh, to work things out with their tenants than the mom and pops. The mom and pop landlords are finding it extremely difficult to come to grips that their rental stream might be interrupted. So, um, so we have this tension uh, between the landlord and the tenant um, that communication is what really needs to happen. Um, somebody is going to bear some loss here. I mean, there's just no question that if rent isn't paid or if somebody can't pay the rent, um, that somebody is going to bear some loss. Who should bear that loss is really um, is the question. So communication, trying to work something out, trying to find the best solution for the parties involved is what needs to happen. And so we're encouraging um, lots of communication. We're offering solutions, you know, blended solutions of maybe you can forgive part of the rent. Maybe you can pay the rent, but not pay the parking or the cam charges. You know, maybe there's a half rent and then later on you can pay it back. Um, so lots of different solutions to try and encourage people to come to the table and talk. So, and I kind of leave this open to the room for Nancy, Roy, Chris. So rent abatement, rent deferral, concessions and rent, a lot of options on the table. What, what are tenants to do if landlords are not offering help? And Roy, I'll let you start with this one. Well, I mean, the reality is that, uh, you know, there are some malls in, in Florida where they're not a single tenant has paid rent. And what the landlords have to recognize is they're not getting another tenant to come into that into that space. I mean, that's the great irony to it, is that if they if they did evict that tenant, who's going in there? I mean, so the, the landlord has to be very careful for what they wish for, because if they do get that vacancy, that space may be vacant for a very long period of time. So the bankruptcy option ends up being a great option because it, it, it buys you the time and it lets the landlord know that they, that they got serious problems also. I mean, one of the problems the landlords are having is their lenders, and some of their lenders are being are working with them, but you have certain kinds of lenders that just don't have the flexibility to work with their, with their landlords. And that's where the crisis actually starts. And yeah, I, think, of the I, think I was just going to jump in. I said too, I, I think, I think it's important. Um, one thing to keep in mind in all these situations, every situation is different. I mean, and then not only are the players different, um, but every jurisdiction is very different. Um, and so I think as you sort of try to think of strategies, whether you're wearing your, you're representing a landlord or you're representing the tenant or you're representing a lender. Um, in all those situations, you have to be very cognizant of the, the jurisdiction that you're practicing in and what the um, both the judicial and legislative um, uh, landscape is like in that particular jurisdiction because it may have a, it may impact your strategy on, on approaching mm -hmm. these these um, uh, contract issues. And, and then I think where I've seen it be successful so far is at where the landlord perhaps hasn't been, um, hasn't offered um, a rent abatement. The, um, the, the tenant, I feel, I feel like where they have the most success talking to the landlord is when, they, when they're just, they're, they're transparent. You know, they come, they come to the table with um, their books and they say, this is where we're at, this is what we can do. Um, this is our plan moving forward. This is where we'd like you to help us. And in those situations, I have found um, even um, reluctant landlords have been more likely to sit down and talk to those tenants and try to find a solution. For the, for the I want to add to what Roy things. mentioned. If I may just add, one of the things that the landlords and tenants have to work together on is where there is government bailout money, whether it's the PPP or the idle money. They have to make sure that they don't change the lease in such a way that rent isn't due during that eight week period. Because if there's no rent that is due and it gets abated and then it's tacked on at the end, then you can't use that PPP money during mm -hmm. that eight week period because there's no rent that's due. So what you wanna make sure is that you're not shooting yourself in the foot by deferring the rent to a period of time where you can't use those funds. Those funds have to be used during cons constricted periods of time, usually eight weeks from the day you get the money. But during those eight weeks, 25% of that money can be used for rent. But if you've got an abatement during those eight weeks, you can't now say, I'm going to pay the rent for a period after or before using that money. That money has to be used during those eight weeks. So you have to be very careful. You have to work with your landlord. The 10 landlord have to work together to come up with a solution that, that, that fits the mold. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And where I've seen, Roy, on that point, where I, what I've seen, too, is to address that issue is the... Um, I haven't seen a lot of abatement yet. Um, maybe that's the next wave as we're into May now. Maybe that's coming. 
Um, but in April, most of, most of the um, solutions I'd seen worked out between the landlords and tenants was more on the deferment nature. Right. But, but, being, but recognizing that issue that you raised, Roy, on the deferment, it, it was an optional, it was optional. So in the event that the PPP funds did come in for that tenant, the tenant had the option to use those funds to pay the rent obligation. And we've done that with a number, and we've done that with a number of our clients. Exactly that is that communicating with them, saying, "Look, these rent funds come in. We'll be glad to pay for that period of time, and then that period that we didn't, we'll just tack it on on the back end, and you'll just get paid a few weeks later. It's not, it's not the end of the world." Right. Yeah. Hey, Chris, coming back to you. So, regarding commercial leases, how will rent abatements or these deferrals affect different industries? Uh, what's the chain of events here? Well, obviously, the landlords the, is is the first you know the, is is the first party that's going to be impacted. But but um, right behind them are the lenders. And as was mentioned before, I think you know the the ability of landlords to meet their debt service uh, obligations is is um, you know going to be impacted for sure. Um, and so the for the for the larger institutional owners, and this may be part of the reason why as um, Nancy had mentioned earlier, some of the institutional owners are more likely um, to provide the rent abatement or work with tenants in that regard, is that they probably have the capital reserves to sort of continue to meet their debt service coverage in the, in the short term, whereas the mom and pop, the smaller landlords may have a harder time doing that. But in any event, the second industry would be obviously the banks and the lenders that are financing these real estate projects. But then it goes, then, then from there, it, it, it um, quickly affects all the industries that depend on the real estate industry, right? So you have your, your, your construction firms, your suppliers, your vendors, your cleaning and maintenance contractors that, that, that clean the properties, the landscaping crews that, that, that provide landscaping services to these properties. They're all going to be affected as the rents stop flowing. Um, so I think it remains to be seen. I mean, I think in the short term, those effects, I mean, certainly speculative construction projects, um, I think are, are gonna be slow walked um, and, and, or stopped in the short term. Um, but I think uh, as far as just ongoing maintenance, I think most so far in April, it's so far so good. Um, I think, um, but you know, what happens in May and June, um, you know, who knows, we'll have to see. And Roy mentioned the uh, potential bankruptcy cases. What are your thoughts, Chris, on repercussions for those who are unable to pay back even rent deferral, if not if if not immediate or at all? What, what what type of kind of problems are we in for? Well, that's down the line. I think I think you know you're going to have obviously you know putting aside the bankruptcies, I think you're going to have a wave of evictions, and I think that's probably going to be inevitable. Um, how how you know the scope. Um, and timing of that, I, I think, is very much TBD. I just we just don't know what where we're we're headed right now, um, as as in terms of both the financial impact that that the first you know 60 days has had, uh, as well as what happens with the actual virus going forward. How quickly we we you know <coughs> find a we find a vaccine and and um, uh, whether or not this there's a resurgence as we sort of open up for business again. Right. There's also an issue with, the, with how things are restructured in that um, some landlords are saying, okay, well, I'll defer one month rent or two months rent, and then you can pay it back over the next four months. And if you think about it, that's a 50% increase in rent for those four months. And that's a big chunk of money to come up with when they're trying to recover from a shutdown. So a lot of these restructures are not very well thought out in terms of the timing of payback. It, it really needs to be spread out over a longer period of time because it's not realistic to have that large expense lumped in um, in, in such large chunks uh, for the tenants. They're, they're not gonna be able to manage it. Do you think and that's going to re lead to the rent abatement uh, potential? Because it's, it's, you're very right. You get to a point in a couple months and a, uh, your tenant can't pay the extra rent because business hasn't come back as swiftly. Uh, right. Will it be to more negotiations, longer terms? What are some options? What, would, what advice would you give to that tenant? Should they be pushing for a longer term repayment or rent, yeah. rent abatement? What are your thoughts? Yeah, so spreading it out over the longest term possible is really the best um, scenario for the tenant um, and for the landlord. I mean, the landlord needs to be reasonable about what's a, what's a good payback. Yeah, they want their money back as soon as possible, but if they're gonna allow for the long-term survivability of their tenant, they need to recognize that uh, 
they can't put the tenant under by overloading the payments on it. Um, so it has to be a reasonable amount of payback on top of the normal rent because the tenant's still going to be recovering from from the slowdown and, and have used up all their reserves. So um, it, there's a reasonability factor that that people need to consider. I, I, I agree with Nancy. I mean, uh, if you could just tack the rent on and extend the lease term, you, you know, you get a four month abatement, take the four months and tack it on at the end and extend the lease four months. That would probably be the best thing. And then the landlord loses, you know, four months of, of cash flow. But in the, in the scheme of things, it really hasn't lost very much, you know. And, and Roy, um, do you think there's any, oh, let me ask, what are the repercussions? How do they differ for commercial tenants versus residential tenants? Well, I, I have a sense that there's going to be a repegging of, of the commodity of real estate by sector. And so if you say, you know, which sectors are going to be hurt the most, you know, retail and, and hotel are, are at the very top, you know, storage and residential may, may actually be at, at the bottom if you have the continuum of who's going to get hurt the most. But you got to ask yourself, how are these tenants, if they're commercial tenants, going to be able to meet the same volume of income if there's going to be social spacing? If only, Like Macy's is reopening up, but only 25% of, of the, the amount of people could come into Macy's I normally can. You know, the, the cosmetic counters, you can't do the testing. If you try something on, uh, it has to, you know, that, that garment has to be put aside for 24 hours. You, uh, half the, uh, three quarters of the fitting rooms are going to be closed. I mean, their cash flow per store is going to be diminished. And in real estate, we value real estate typically by how much cash a particular type of property, the highest and best use can generate. So is real estate a commodity like oil? And if it is, we're going to be going through a deflationary repegging of certain sectors of real estate. And that is not inconsistent with what has happened in other pandemics historically, if you go back and look at what happened to prices in general after a pandemic. Hmm. And so kind of switching to uh, lenders and borrowers, Nancy, um, as you work with them, what's the best advice you'd give to someone looking to borrow capital right now, uh, getting a loan? Uh, well, that's going to be a hard sell <laughs> uh, to borrow some money at this point. Um, the lenders are working with existing borrowers, though. I mean, I think that um, any project is going to go through some big scrutiny if it was being considered right now. I do know of a couple of government leased buildings that are going forward, and they're actually looking forward to the construction prices having to go down because of the lack of um, demand that there will be. So they'll be able to reprice their construction at a much more reasonable amount, given that some other projects won't go forward. So that's a positive that will come out of it. But as far as um, financing a new project, I agree with um, Christopher that the spec projects um, are gonna go away uh, because of the um, possible lack of tenant base. On existing borrowings, um, the good news for borrowers is that banks have been given guidance and direction from the FDIC to work with their borrowers. So banks have been given leeway to provide concessions to their borrowers, except they're not called concessions. Um, they're, they're workouts, they're, they're working with their borrowers. They can give um, extensions of up to six months. They can um, waive debt service requirements. They can provide certain concessions to the borrowers, provided the borrowers were not um, in default or behind in their payments prior to the COVID crisis. So good standing borrowers are allowed to have some workouts given to them by the banks per the FDIC's guidance as of April 7th, so that um, the banks then can allow those borrowers not to go into immediate default. And that the benefit of these concessions are that um, the banks won't be criticized for having made these workouts. And that's, that's kind of the big savings. This direction makes it so the banks can do this without fear of repercussion later on from the FDIC and, and downgrades in capitals or downgrades in loans. These, these workouts will be okay. Um, now, six months down the road, who knows what we're going to be looking at and if, if you know, we'll get different direction. But these initial workouts will be okay and not create impact, financial impact on the banks, which means that the banks are willing to do it. The last thing they want to do is have impacts on their capital when they make these adjustments. So um, the banks are encouraged to do it. And um, so that's good news for borrowers. Mm. Well, I, I, would, I would say that the one wrinkle in that ointment could be the requirement to get new appraisals. And the question is going to be, how are these appraisers going to realistically appraise these properties? Are they going to do it, you know, 
BC before Corona, or are they going to do it AD or DD dur you know, during the disease? And, and doing a DD type of appraisal during the disease is going to be tough. And they can't speculate and say, oh, this will be after the disease, because we're not after the disease. And to go BC, that's another planet. That's another universe that we have left. And so that's going to be the, the, the tough part for banks. Are they going to have to write down these assets? And that, that could be a real issue as it relates to uh, their, their, you know, their solvency. Mm. Thoughts, Nancy, Chris, on this? On this one, um, as it stands right now, they're not being required to do new appraisals, to do any of these adjustments. These are strictly sort of um, based on current borrower um, books. Now, just like in any crisis, you always have freeloaders, right? You always have people who say, hey, I'm going to use this excuse to get some free money or to get my not have to pay my rent or not have to pay my loan payment. Well, the banks, you know, and many landlords are onto this. And so banks are requiring that you provide, here's, you know, show me your financial statement. Hey, you've got some reserves. You can make this payment. You know, I don't need to give you a waiver. But if the borrower can show, hey, look, I had to shut down my business or half of my tenants aren't paying rent, then the banks are allowed to make those adjustments again without fear of re repercussion, at least in this initial guidance. Mm -hmm. So there's not a lot of requirements placed on them it's in their discretion to make those judgments um, in a safe and prudent manner. And Chris, uh, I want to go back to, we, we talked about um, uh, the PPP loan earlier as one of the government assistance. Do you think, uh, is there hope for any further government assistance programs, uh, whether that's a, at a federal level or even at local state levels? Uh, sure. Yeah. So, so um, at the federal level, um, you know, we've had effectively four COVID acts so far, um, 3.5, if you will, being the most recent one. Um, but they are, I, I know Congress is now actively talking about, you know, uh, CARES Act 2.0, um, which will be, again, be, I think, in the uh, sort of focused on direct relief to taxpayers, um, and, and similar to um, the, the first CARES Act. Um, perhaps also extending some of those programs, including the PPP program, that eight week period, extending that out maybe to 10 weeks or, or, or longer. Um, the, um, uh, also, I'm, 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 I think in the next uh, act, they're gonna have, um, or at least they're certainly talking about trying to um, have some uh, pockets of money, bundles of money to um, help uh, with some of this contact tracing um, for the virus and, and, and those things, which will, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out and, and how that actually gets implemented in practice, because that all may have some kind of effect on how we, how quickly we're able to get back to normal in, in our sort of traditional retail sense, as, you know, as Roy mentioned before, the practicality and the viability of a model where you can only use 25% of your sales area to, to sell um, isn't, doesn't bode well for the long term, obviously. Mm -hmm. So some of these, some of these um, other programs may help us get back to normal a little bit quicker. Um, then I think the the shortly on the heels of COVID 4.0 or, uh, or COVID 4 is there, there's a phase five, which is the um, uh, is is expected to be more sort of the big infrastructure bill that Trump talked about early on, and that's designed as a way to get Americans back to work. Um, and so by, by making funds available for infrastructure projects that um, are sort of have some kind of guarantee to, to, to get so many uh, people back to work. Um, and that's probably sometime later this summer from, from what I'm hearing. Mm. Do, you, well, do you think there's any proposed legislation that will require landlords to cut rent? Uh, and if so, what kind of impact would that have? I don't think so. I don't, I, I think at the federal level, um, I, I don't believe that there that Congress is is seriously considering getting between you know the landlord and tenant relationship directly that way to say hey landlords you must cut rent I think they you know in in um, you know the the fourth phase of, of this COVID legislation I think the expectation is to continue to provide resources to individuals that allow them hopefully to make the rent payments. Um, but but not not directly say landlords you can't charge or you must cut rent. Now at the at, that's at the federal level. At the local level, you know the jurisdictions are all over the map on this. You know here in D.C. there's there's a bill now that's going to help that's that purports to 
do almost that. In other words, you know, not necessarily cut rent, but allow landlords um, or allow tenants not to pay rent and require effectively commercial landlords to give some kind of rent forbearance um, on a going forward basis. Um, so, um, and I don't know what, what the, what the landscape looks like in Florida or California, but the local level, uh, I said, there's, there's varying programs that are intended to do something like that. Now, Phil, that's a slippery slope and, and, and without getting into politics, historically, our protection of property rights is what allowed the capital flow to come into this country and make it literally the, the first place that people would want to invest anywhere in the world. And we're seeing that now with our stock market all the flows are coming into the United States. And so the reason for that is we've been very protective of property rights from the, from the, the time this nation has started. If we start to erode that, we could erode our ability to attract new capital in the future. And while people you know, need to be protected, at some point, the spigot will be closed, the tidal wave will begin, and there will be a foreclosure of, a, a wave of foreclosures that will allow new money to actually acquire the property at a discount and there'll be a purge and, and there'll be a, a, a new cycle that, that starts over. And when that happens and how that happens, I'm not sure. But historically, that always does happen and it will happen again. And in fact, these vulture funds are being set up right now, particularly in the hotel industry. Billions and billions of dollars are being set aside to pluck out, you know, failing hotel properties, you know, particularly in, in urban centers around this country. Nancy, what about in California? What are your thoughts in, in regards to this, uh, this question? So uh, in California, there is some pending legislation, which um, I'm crossing my fingers does not pass, that would have a 25% requirement let landlords um, forgive rent or not, um, or require them to cut rent. So I'm, I'm hopeful that, you know, sounder minds will prevail. And, and I agree with Roy that the sanctity of the contract should prevail and other ways to protect tenants or other ways to assist people will be, um, will be gone through. But the one thing I wanted to mention as sort of a ray of hope is that when you look at, um, for our real estate industry in general and how we operate, if you look at Asia and their recovery, um, they do operate in a different way, um, you know, for retail uh, as they have recovered. Um, but it has not meant, and, you know, considering that they've gone through SARS and the, the Asian, uh, the bird flu before the other pandemics, um, their retail and their office and hotel have recovered just fine and they haven't had an impact on their values and their industry in general. And they just operate in a different way with a more social understanding of how to deal with it, with the um, uh, um, contagion, you know, the contagious is aspects of, of the flu. So for instance, before you can go in McDonald's, there's going to be, you know, a person there at the entry that's going to check your temperature. And so you can't go through and they have, you know, social distancing within the restaurant. So some things, you know, are adjusted when they're in, um, you know, the high level alert stage, but then things go back to normal at a certain point, but then they know how to react quickly to shut things down. So if you observe and, and talk to people in Shanghai and Hong Kong and the Philippines, where they actually have gone through this a couple of times, there's there's ways to deal with it. And it has not been um, sort of the end of the real estate industry per se. So I think there is a ray of hope for us, you know, that, yeah, we're going to have some big adjustments because Americans aren't used to this at all. But I think that, you know, we're going to learn how to work with it and um, make it work for us too. I want to uh, touch back on something we talked about earlier. When we're talking about the scrutiny of the contracts themselves, force majeure keeps coming up. Chris, um, are there any talks uh, amongst the legal community? Do you, do you expect to see a flood of these force majeure suits in our future? Oh, sure. Yeah, I think I think that's 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 inevitable. Um, I, I don't. I think it's too early yet. I mean, I haven't. I haven't. Um, uh, you know, the, the the landscape is yet to be determined and how that's going to work out. I think the best guess, and from litigators that I work with and have spoken to about it, is that you know, it's, it's inevitable there'll be a wave of litigation coming out of this and, and how it's dealt with in the courts. I think the general perception is, or expectation is, is that a lot of the courts will kind of take a wait and see approach, um, at least at the appellate level where, 
they're going to try to see, you know, what what is deemed to be a a, a force majeure event and an act of God, and how and how is that um, going to be applied as a defense to the obligations under the applicable contract? So, I I, I think it's it's inevitable, but how it ultimately plays out, I think, is going to take some time because I think ultimately it'll be at the appellate level that it gets ultimately resolved. Mm. So uh, we're running uh, out of time here. I want to ask one question to everyone, and I'll go. Uh, I'll start with I'll start with you, Chris. Um, what What do you think? What do you think the possible shape of real estate is to come? How is How is what we're going through right now paralleling and differing from our last recession in this market? Well, I think um, as far as what's to come uncertainty you know i i think it's anybody's guess you know i think it's both um as mentioned before you know how quickly we come out of this depends on a lot of factors you know and um one of the biggest one is how quickly we find a cure um for the coronavirus um but also whether or not we see a resurgence as we sort of are all um coming out of our homes and returning to work so i think uh, i think the next couple months will be really instructive on where we go um, and, and, and how quickly we come out of this. But for, for the short term, um, you know, uh, the effects, you know, we've mentioned some of them, you know, on the retail industry, um, you know, the, the social distancing practices um, and how that, imp- how that affects, you know, the viability of the um, traditional real estate, retail real estate model. You know, how's that going to work? Um, and, and I don't know, you know, I think Roy already touched on those. I mean, how, how, how can you remain viable when you can't use all of the retail real estate platform for purposes of sales? And I think that that ultimately is going to have a, a much greater effect on the smaller mom and pops that rely on in-store sales to fund the majority of their rent. You know, the larger national retailers, you know, the, the, the percentage of sales that is dedicated to rent is much smaller than the mom and pops. So they, the, the foot traffic in their store is a big driver. So if they can't come back quickly, then they may go away. Um, and so we, the, the, the retail mall may look very, very different than it does today. Um, it may be, it, that may be just um, uh, fast forwarding what was inevitably going to be coming anyway. Mm-hmm. But I think certainly the transition to online retail um, is is also going to be something we see that's going to have a big impact on traditional bricks and mortar stores. Um, you know, the hospitality industry will look very different in the short term. Um, you know, again, Roy mentioned this too. The hotel, that hotel product is very challenged right now. Um, you know, I think uh, the again, this is in the short term. I think the um, drive to destinations. Um, we'll do much better than the fly to destinations because no one's anxious to get on a plane right now and go anywhere. Um, so those destinations and the real estate product there, like the hotels and those locations will probably do better. Um, you know, in the office context, um, you know, how you address workers coming back into the office in a multi-tenanted building, it's, it's TBD. I don't, I don't know what the best practices will be, but they're obviously, it's going to be very different. You know, it's the, the obvious ones are, you know, hand sanitizers at the elevators and more and more regular cleaning of the building. But um, uh, beyond that, I don't know. You know, you have the you have OSHA in the background, too, for employers, you know, that needed to be sensitive to. And I don't know that anybody knows yet what the best practices are. I mean, like I said, there's the obvious ones about just trying to be clean. But what does that mean? Like, well, how often do you have to clean, you know? How much, where, how often, where, how many locations do you have to have the hand sanitizer, you know, to be deemed reasonable? So there's a lot that has yet to be determined. Nancy, do you have any additional thoughts? Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's also the impact on our social lives, too. Think about all the events that you go to, the festivals, the races, um, the group events where you have a potluck, and um, even kids events, soccer games, scouting events, all those things where we, we get together as groups. You know, how are those things going to be affected? There's an economic effect on that, and there's also an impact on our, on our um, you know, the social fabric of our lives as well, um, and how we use uh, premises um, are all affected by that, um, and infrastructure. So 
you know, there are silver linings everywhere. You know, the transportation industry is going to benefit from a lot more, you know, delivery services, things like that. Um, industrial is going to do extremely well because that last mile and all those, you know, additional deliveries from online deliveries is going to be hugely benefited by, um, you know, the transition from um, bricks and mortar to more online and continuing online office space is going to look different, but guess what? You know, a lot more home offices are going to be improved. People are going to spend more on their, you know, extra additions to their homes in order to have a better home office. So there's always a silver lining that comes out of this, but there's no question that um, there are going to be um, some losers that are very unfortunate. Um, and, you know, there's going to be some sad stories for sure. And, uh, you know, we can't really do a lot about that, but it's it's just the impact of the market and the impact of some um, unfortunate events. And Roy, uh, any anything to add as well? Well, I, I think as a human species, we are very resourceful, and 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 we're certainly a, 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 in have a lot of endurance. And in the real estate market, in particular, has always learned to morph and and reinvent itself. And so when we do come out of this, it's not going to be back to normal. It's not going to be the new normal. It's going to be a new abnormal. And so, you know, with hotel, average hotel rooms are right now $18 a night. I mean, that's just absurd. I mean, uh, J. Crew just announced that they're going bankrupt. I mean, I mean, this is a venerable company. They're in every mall. They have a good online presence. And so we're going to see a lot of change. There's going to be a lot of repositioning. A lot of hotels may end up being hospitals. I mean, the idea of, of shared communal office space like a WeWorks is going to have to be completely rethought. I mean, shared kitchens, shared office space that all may not work in this, in this model. I mean, people are going to work more at home. They're going to telecommute. They're going to use Zoom. And so a lot of office space is, is going to have to be repositioned. Some of it will probably become nice new residences that can be used as, 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 a, as an office and also a home. And so we're going to reposition a lot of our real estate. A lot of communal types of living are going to be relooked at. People may move more to the burbs. The cities may have to re reinvent themselves. I mean, New York has been around much longer than this country for hundreds and hundreds of years. There'll be a rebirth, but I, I know that we're going to have to rethink a lot of the old paradigms that we had before this. It will not just be going back to how life was. It's not possible because we're so used to new customs now. I mean, my staff never wanted to work at home, and now they love working at home. I mean, explain that. I had to kick them out of the office, and now I'm not sure how quickly they want to come back, and that's okay, and that's okay. Well, thank you. Thank you all, uh, Roy, uh, Nancy, and Chris, for joining me this morning. Uh, I appreciate uh, your insight and the silver linings to find as well. Uh, I wish you the best during these, uh, these next few months. And um, again, thank you so much.